October the 31st, this year, we will celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, what Protestant historians refer to as a time of, of spiritual renewal. Uh, there are many causes and many effects for the Reformation, but ultimately, it's the story of God and man, and peace with God and man. And the ultimate microcosm of that Reformation is Martin Luther. Uh, it's the story of a man who was aware of God, afraid of God, reconciled by God, to be alive in God. And all that goes before and all that comes after is fleshed out in the story of this man. Uh, underneath the, the Reformation are three foundational principles. Number one is the supremacy of Scripture. Luther was raised in the Roman Church uh, as a result of a terrifying experience. He joined a monastery. Uh, his relationship with God could only be characterized by terror. Uh, the Church had taught him that um, they were the authority in their lives. The door to heaven was owned by the church and you paid the church to go through the door. Uh, Luther was a scholar. Uh, he would have been a scholar apart from religion. He began to study intensely. Uh, he became a nuisance to his superiors and they, to get rid of him, relegated him to the study of scripture. And uh, it was in that study that he learned that councils could err. It was in that study he learned that popes had not always been trustworthy. But there was one source, and only one source, that ultimately provided truth. And uh, it was that principle that underscored everything he did. It was the essence of his uh, defense at Worms. Um, unless you can prove me wrong by scripture, Scripture says, uh, not the church, not the priest, not even Martin Luther, Scripture says, and that is still the only a source, the only source of true authority that we have. And so everything that happens in the Reformation turns on this concept of authority that Luther captured when he restored Scripture to a place of primacy. The second principle is justification by faith. And uh, Luther had sought to find peace with God. This is not a casual man. This is not a, uh, an indifferent man seeking to find a deviant way to heaven. Uh, this is a very intense man who, who is seeking God and uh, can't find it. Uh, he had been taught that you could find God through confession. and. Um, he confessed until he actually really had nothing more to confess, at least not in the eyes of his uh, superiors. Uh, and yet there was no peace with God. You visit Erfurt, they would take you to the cell where they would find him spread eagle on the floor, passed out from fasting and, and, and the rigorous demands uh, that he had imposed upon himself, uh, even beyond the church. But as he studied that Bible, uh, he became keenly aware of the book of Romans and a passage in Romans that says that the righteousness of God, Luther said, I hated the word, the righteousness of God, because he said righteousness of God was the essence of what I was afraid of. Um, and yet after reading and reading it and rereading it, Romans 1.17 says that the righteousness of God is revealed in the fact that the just are made alive by faith. Righteousness and faith, not righteousness and works, but righteousness and faith. And um, it was totally liberating, totally liberating, uh, that a man could come to God and confess his sins and trust in the promise of the word. The songwriter, The Haven of Rest,
captures this very, very well. I yielded myself to his tender embrace and faith taking hold of the word. That is a procreational moment, a moment of spiritual life when nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. It's faith plus nothing in that seminal moment when, when we're made alive, much as the procreational illustration would, would offer us. And that brings us to the third principle, which is the priesthood of the believer. Now this person who has been estranged from God and afraid of God is now alive in God and is authorized on the basis of the blood of Christ to come frequently, as so frequently as they desire, into the very presence of God. And Romans 1.17 not only implies that we are made alive by faith, but it says we continue to live by faith. The model doesn't change. You don't get saved by faith and then have to just keep up the works in order to maintain a relationship. Um, you will be obedient, but it's not the works that save you. The Roman church had taken that veil that had been rent top to bottom. They had re-sewed that veil so that only the priestly caste could enjoy access into the presence of God. And then the people went through intermediaries, uh, whether it was a confessional booth or through Mary. Um, once again, that veil was rent. And uh, every individual could come without the mass, without the priest, uh, which the Roman church had sewed it up. And now Luther found what the church had lost and uh, made it possible that we could have a relationship with God and then live daily in the presence of God on the basis of the blood of Christ. That is a powerful spiritual message, but it also had implications for the Roman church itself, which in turn had implications for the political effects of the entire world. So it's not wrong to say that October the 31st, 1517, was a world-changing event, even though it happened in the context of God and man. And so on this day, October the 31st, uh, we'll remember and we will enjoy and we will anticipate the fruits of the Protestant Reformation, the efforts of Martin Luther, remembering that scripture is supreme that we can be made right with God through faith and that we have access into the very presence of the Lord.